the 15. John 15. This is actually the last I am statement John records regarding Christ. Of course, the Jews knew what he meant when he says, I am. Classing himself, the Lord Jesus, of being God. Remember, God said to Moses, the burning bush, I am, I am. I am the self sufficient, self existent God, one of those very being of being the eternal one. So, in John chapter 15, verse 1, this is the Satan, of course, just proceeding as he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, it's late Thursday evening. Um, of course, the the Passover. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. That shot is gone in the moment's pride. For without me you can do nothing. The man abide not in me. He is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. A man gather them, and cast them into the fire, that they are burned, consumed. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Here is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So the, the key is to abide in God's love, to know his presence in a greater way, to raise obedience. Verse 11 as well. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And how do we keep yourselves in the love of God? And of course, how do we know the joy of the Lord? His presence is by being obedient. Jesus already, David even said in Psalm 51, when he was in total repentance, and he says, Lord, restore the joy of my salvation. He had lost it, you see, for almost a year when he tried to cover up his sin. And many believers, or even professing believers, have, even true believers tonight, have lost the joy of the Lord. And yet the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit well in every true believer. And some have lost their joy. They're downcast, they're struggling, they're not knowing the victory, the freedom which there is in Christ. They're ineffective, they're unproductive. They're full of fear. But that should not be. Well, if we are obedient to God's word, we will know his joy. This is what the scriptures tell us. That your joy might be full. No God will bless these 11 verses to us this evening. The Bible uses many analogies to describe God's relationship to his people. Such as he is the shepherd, they are the sheep. He is the builder, they are the building. He is the master, they are his servants. He is their father, they are his children. He is the husband, they are his bride. He is the head, they are his body. But here we have one of the most well-known analogies of all in the scriptures, which is the seventh and last I am statements Jesus has declared himself to be God. In this gospel, John in verse 1 a, he says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. What is an analogy? Maybe some of you don't realize what an analogy is. An analogy is a comparison.
between one thing and another. Typically for the purpose of explanation or clarification. Jesus had presented this analogy to his disciples late on the Thursday evening. And of course Jesus is not a tree or a grape vine. Literally, it's like Jesus said he is the door. He's not a literal door. That's why he's using analogy. It was a comparison for a purpose of explanation or clarification. And he had presented this analogy to his disciples late on Thursday evening in the upper room just preceding the Garden of Gethsemane where Christ would agonize in intense prayer just before his arrest. It shows the importance of prayer, folks, and I cannot emphasize it enough when the Son of God needed to pray. And there was never ever in the history of prayer, and there's been great prayer meetings down through the years in church history, all night prayer meetings, people broken, water, tears, everything, pouring out their souls before God, but there's never ever the intensity of prayer like this. The Lord Jesus Christ, before he went to the cross, he needed prayer so to strengthen him. This analogy would have brought comfort to the disciples. Their world was ready to be shattered. Their Messiah, the Lord and Savior, was ready to depart. And Jesus was given them this analogy, this picture. Of their vital relationship with them. It showed how they were connected, linked, attached, in vital union, and that's how when someone's truly converted, the miracle is the greatest miracle, is the greatest thing can ever happen, experience can ever happen to any man or woman or boy or girl or whatever, is when they pass from death into life. Salvation, folks, is the highest thing can ever happen to anyone. It's the greatest thing. And someone has taken from darkness into his marvelous light. When someone is truly saved, they'll never, ever, ever, ever be the same again. They are new creatures. All things pass away. All things become new. And when someone is saved, they, they, they enter into a dynamic, living, supernatural relationship. God dwells within them through the Spirit. God works through them through the Spirit. They're in vital union with the Lord Jesus Christ. They are attached, they are linked, they are connected. It is personal, it is intimate. It is even more intimate than even a husband and wife in a physical union. This is spiritual folks we're dealing with. Thank God, what a glorious God, the new birth. When God enters the soul, the Puritans got it right. And they get a lot of things right. When it says God, what is the new birth? What is regeneration? It's when God enters the soul of man and woman with eternal life. Because God is eternal life. Jesus explained to them that he is the true vine, and they are the branches. And just as the branch entirely depends on the vine for life. For growth, for sustenance, and for fruit, so we as believers completely depend on the Lord for spiritual resources and life in itself. And not just us, the whole universe, everything in this universe, all depend on God. God does not depend on anything. Everything depends on God. God is the living God. In Him we live and move. And have our very being, and as God's people, especially in the spiritual realm, we totally depend on Him. He is the one who produces, He is the fountain of living waters. And we are helpless and can do nothing without Him. What a great pride crusher it is. The sample of truth the Lord communicated with his disciples regarding this analogy in these 11 verses 
is the vine and the branches. Was this little reward, if you've noticed it, as, we, as I was reading it a few minutes ago, this little reward, abide, is mentioned nine times in verses 4, 5, 6, 7, and 10. And when the Lord repeats words in a passage, this is the thread, this is the main theme coming through. This word abide is absolutely essential in regarding salvation. It is meno, a meno in the Greek, which means something that remains, where it is as it continues in a fixed state, it remains, it is a fixed state. It is a permanent fixed state. It endures, does not depart. Just like, in a sense, as the Lord declared, as I spoke for a number, maybe a month ago or so, under them earlier to the disciples, that the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, would abide with you forever. This analogy proves that the true believer abides while the false believer departs. It is a beautiful spiritual picture of the believers under the walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. As Christ abides in him or her, and he abides in Christ just the way the branch is connected to the vine, and the vine is connected to the branch. The Lord Jesus Christ was explained to his disciples that he is the true source of spiritual vitality, spiritual strength, spiritual growth. Spiritual life and spiritual productivity. Verse 1a, I am the true vine. Verse 5a, I am the vine. To the Jewish disciples, this was not, was not confusion language. This was clarity to them. This was normal to them in a sense. This image of Jesus speaking to them about the vine, it was not something new. As in Israel, the cultivation of vineyards was a popular procedure, infrastructure, to the life and economy of Israel. So it was not a secret to them. It wasn't a hard saying. It wasn't a deep things of God in that sense. It wasn't deep doctrine, deep theology. It was... Illumination to them. There are actually three different vines found in Scripture. First of all, you have the past vine, which was the nation of Israel. But sadly, because of their rebellion and disobedience for many, many, many centuries, it is improbable how God and his love and mercy and tenderness, how he didn't consume them on the spot. Moses interceded, he spurred them. Then he raised up another generation after Joshua, or in Joshua's time, he went to the promised land. Then he raised up, was it 12 to 14 judges? A judge was raised up to restore them, and then they went back into their evil ways, and then he raised up Samuel. Then he raised up the prophets like Elijah and Elisha, and the list can go on and on and on. He was so long suffering with them. But it came to that point, he sent the son, and they still rejected him. So now, dear friends, we are in the times of the Gentiles. The past vine was the nation of Israel, but sadly because of its rebellion and disobedience and produced wild grapes. It was meant to be Israel, or meant to be a shining light to the Gentile nations around them. They were the most privileged nations. They had the oracles of God, did the word of God, did the priesthood, did the temple, did the miracles, did the prophets. And yet they completely and utterly rebelled. And they reduced wild grapes on righteousness instead of righteousness, and openly rejected God's glorious God. 
the son the true vine, as he came to the vineyard of Israel, but they received him not, but cast him out and killed him. Then we have the future vine in Revelation 14, which we studied at, remember it must have been three, four years ago from this pulpit. What is the future vine in Revelation 14? This is the evil Gentile world system ripening for God's judgment under the leadership of Antichrist. True believers are branches in the vine of heaven, while the unsaved are branches in the vine of the earth. They are earth dwellers. We are our citizenship is in heaven, who will be cut down and burnt up at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here in the context here, what was Jesus speaking about? We have here the true vine, the present vine. The true vine, of course, being the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, as Jesus identifies himself personally as being the true vine. I am the true vine, verse 1 verse 5 I am the vine. Jesus is the perfect, original, genuine, true vine in which as true believers, we do not live on substitutes. Because we are in a living, loving, lasting union relationship with Christ, and we belong to Him, we are attached to Him, we are linked to Him, He being the head and we being the body, the true vine, and us the branches. And verse 1 here also speaks about the vine dresser. So, first of all, what we've gathered is that Jesus is explaining. He is the true vine. Well, what else can we get out in verse 1? It speaks here about the vine dresser. Jesus here, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man, the vine dresser. God the Father is like the farmer who tills the soil. He plants, he fertilizes and waters as he cures for it. So the same principle is used here that God the Father, in this analogy, being the vine dresser, is in charge of curing for the vines, God's people, the three branches. God the Father, the vine dresser, purges or prunes the branches so that they would bear much fruit. Verse 2, it says here, to be on every branch that beareth fruit, he us God the Father, the vine dresser, purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. The pruning process can be painful. And it is painful. I'm sure we've all experienced it in different trials of life. And there's normally a cost of serving the Lord. As he refines us, we looked at this morning about burning the dross, purifying the gold. He's the potter, we're the clay. And the Lord prunes his people. The refinest, the burn up the dross, the take away the rough edges. The vine dresser prunes the branches in two ways here. He cuts away the dead wood, which can breed disease on insects, but also living tissue that can jeopardize the quality of the crop. In fact, at times the vine dresser will even cut away, remove whole branches of grapes so that the rest of the crop will be of higher quality. God wants both quantity and quality in his children's lives. God expects his people to live a high standard in this dark, evil world we live in. God, you see, it says, be ye clean and burn the vessels of the Lord. God says about purging those things and being an honored, sanctified vessel meet for the master's use. God's standard is always high standard. It's not like the world's standard. 
And he expects, he purges us, he prunes us, as we are the branches. He refines us, he shapes and molds us, so that we will produce even a greater crop. That we will live quality, sanctified lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. It is a very serious and high standard to be truly called into the ministry. Full time especially to serve the Lord, yet it is the most greatest, highest privilege. George Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher in the Victorian age, in which God used mightily and God moved in wonderful power especially over England. He says, if God calls you to be a minister, don't suit to becoming a king. If God calls you to be a minister, don't suit to becoming a king. God's standard, you see, is high. It's high for all of us. It's not that the minister is any more holier or walking closer to God than his congregation. But nevertheless, he's called to live a holy life. It's a high standard. In Christ's analogy, the vine dresser have two primary responsibilities. God the Father, in other words, who is the vine dresser. First of all, he will remove the branches that did not bear fruit. Who are these people? Jesus is speaking about in this analogy. These people are the professing false believers. In verse 2 a, every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch of birth fruit he purgeth. Verse 6 He, if a man abide not in me, great Jesus says, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. In other words, their life is worthless. Their life has been futile, vanity. No matter what the Lord thinks of that person, if they're rich, but they've accumulated a mass of goods, they're popular, they're winsome, it makes no difference if they're not in the vine, if they're not saved, if they're not a true branch, their life is meaningless, worthless, it's gathered up and burned. But secondly here, the vine dresser, God the Father, he prunes the ones that did bear fruit, the true believers, which enable them to produce more fruit, verse 2b. And every branch that bears fruit, he purgeth it, that's his true children, that it may bring forth more fruit. And as God's children and next folks, I trust, we are developing more and more in our sanctification, becoming more and more mature in the Lord. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. So now let us discover the vine branches here. First of all, these vine branches are the genuine true believers. Who are the abiding branches which result in blessings? The true believers, you see, abide. The true believers persevere. The Spirit of God remains, abides in the true believer forever. The true believers transform. They have divine impulses. They have divine inclinations. They have divine promptings because God's Spirit, God's nature dwells within every true child of thine, every true branch. They will desire the things of God, they'll never be the same. Before the Lord saved me, dear friends, I didn't have one inclination or interest in the things of God. It was all self pleasure seeking. See what the world could offer me gratification, lust from every angle. But when the Lord transforms a life, you're totally changed. You go a different direction, old things pass away, all things become new. 
Our brother Jim saved 55 years, he mentioned the other night in the prayer meeting. Because he's truly saved 55 years, walking in a sin caused evil, perverted, terrible generation. What keeps that man? It's God's grace because the Spirit remains in him forever. It shows the distinction between the true branch, the true believer, and the false. The false does not abide. In verse 4 and 5 it says, Abide in me and I am you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, he that abides in me and I am him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. The marks of the true branches, the believers, is that they bear fruit. Verse 2, it tells us verse 4, verse 5 and 8, they bear fruit. If you don't see someone bearing fruit, folks, no matter what they profess, give them time to see. They're not saved. The Lord allows trials, we looked at it this morning in the, in the parable of the soils, He allows trials to come into the lives to, to sift out the true believer from the false. When the trials and the persecutions come, they go back to their own ways. You see, they were never in. And Jesus is making this distinction between the true branches and the false branches. God's true children, I know some of us bear more fruit than others, but we will still bear fruit. Bearing fruit consists of many different categories. Some people bear fruit regarding soul winning. It's God and His providence. God has ordained it. God and sovereignty gives them souls. It's not about them, how wonderful they are. You see, some sow, some reap. God gives the increase. So, some con fruit consists of soul winning. Fruit also consists of holiness and obedience. A godly Christ honor life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, faith, gentleness, temperance, long suffering, etc., etc. You see, fruit consists of a godly, consistent life, Christ likeness. Fruit also consists of generous giving. Fruit also consists of hospitality. Fruit also consists of good works. We are part of his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created on the good works. Fruit also consists of rejoicing and praise the Lord. The true believer consistently walks in the light, walks in purity, walks in faith, walks in love, walks worthy of the vocation in which he or she has been called to, walks in humility, walks in the spirit, which is a general pattern of a righteous lifestyle to the glory of God as it produces fruit. Dear friends, if you're in the workplace, or wherever you are, people should know why you're a Christian or not. There's a clear distinction. You will bear fruit. If you live a godly life, it is absolutely such a distinction between it and this world. They will see it, their work friends are not saved. Of course that does not mean that we obey the Lord perfectly at all times, we don't. We are not totally perfect or sinless. We will be when, when the Lord brings us to glory. There is times of feelings which can result of course in chastenings from the Lord. This is one of the reasons God prunes us so that we will become more spiritually productive. For whom the Lord loveth, the Hebrew writer says, he chasteneth. 
and scourgeth every son who he receiveth. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless afterward yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. God is so tender with all of us, only his grace carries us. There's times that we temporize with the Lord, we can fall, no doubt about it. We can come cold and hot. We can even become better at times towards God. We ought to be realistic. We can even backslide. Even though it's not mentioned in the New Testament, but nevertheless it's mentioned in the Old Testament. But God will bring his people, his true people back. While it has to be chastened, while it has to be scourging, he will do it. As Lloyd Jones says, if he has to use a chisel on us to bring us to glory, he will do it. That's why, dear friends, it is the most privileged thing to be, ever, to be saved by the grace of God, but it is the most serious thing. Christ did not die in vain for his people. We are not our own, we are bought with Christ, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. God the Father, he see, prunes the true branches by removing the dross that would sap their spiritual zeal and hinder them from becoming more fruitful. God is more interested than in our holiness than even our happiness. Think of Paul, the good apostle. He asked the Lord, touched on this morning, Lord, heal me from this affliction. Three times he asked the Lord, and the Lord didn't do it. Because he, he allowed Satan's messenger to buffet him, to keep him humble. Because pride could have entered the heart. They're greater to agree with Paul because he was, a, he, said he was brought up to the heavens, the third heaven, they seen the revelations of God, and they could have been boastful. So God allowed Satan's messenger, which shows God is sovereign over every realm, including the, the evil realm as well, to keep him humble. And God prunes his people. He refines us. And ultimately it is to be conformed more and more like the Son, more Christ-like. A godly Christ on our life is the best advertisement for Christianity. A godly Christ on our life is the best advertisement for Christianity. Pruning was a common cultural practice in Israel. Someone said the first pruning occurred in spring. When vines were in flowering stage, this involved four stages, the removal of the growing tips of the vigorous shoots so that they would not grow too rapidly. Secondly, cutting off approximately one feet from the end of the growing shoots to prevent entire shoots being snapped by the wind. Thirdly, the removal of some flower or grape clusters so that those left could produce more and better quality fruit. Fourthly, the removal of suckers from the trunk and main branches so that the strength of the vine was not trapped by the suckers. Notice here the, the actions of removal and cut off are mentioned in these four stages. And the Lord desires and expects his true branches. Christ's bride in the process of sanctification of the Lord is, is pruning us. But also he expects us to mortify, to cut off, to remove things. From our lives which are not profitable for our spiritual lives. He, don't want, he doesn't want our lives to be too cluttered up. He wants to be single lives for glory. And if not, then the Lord will prune and chastise. Paul exhorts us to mortify the deeds of the flesh, to abstain, to cut off, to deny self. Do not yield, but rather yield your members, eyes, ears, feet, hands, your members, and your body as instruments of righteousness unto God. What does Peter remind us to abstain from all fleshly lusts which war against your soul? God in his infinite perfect wisdom prunes us as he allows trials. Trials is a gift from God, folks. First, for, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. Read it yourself. God has three tools, mainly how he, he prunes us, how he, he shapes us and molds us. It's through prayer is through the word and is through trials and God in his infinite perfect wisdom prunes us as trials suffering refining is the handle of the father's knife 
on the blade is the word of God. It is the handle of the Father's knife, and the blade is the word of God. God's word, you see, sanctifies us, it cleanses us. Verse 3, Jesus says, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, as it has a major transforming impact on our lives. But also God uses his word as a pruning knife. It is sharp. It is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing of the soul of spirit. The psalmist reminds us that it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn thy statutes, thy word. God's pure, perfect words are profitable. It is of our benefit for our spiritual conduct and reduces fruit. Verse 4 and 5 Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abide for me and I am in the same, bringeth forth much fruit. Because God is good, God is holy, God is perfect, God is righteous, Christ injects his goodness into his children. By his Spirit, we've been baptized by the Spirit into Christ. As we are connected to him, Jesus said in Matthew 7, Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. You shall know them by their fruits. In other words, a sulcus. So we've discovered the true vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've discovered the vine dresser, God the Father. We've discovered the true abiding vine branches, the true believers in Christ. And finally, here, the only two pages here have yet. As I conclude, we have the false, non abiding branches. The false believers here. Verse 2 a Every branch of me that birth not fruit, he taketh away. Verse 6. He if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. These false branches are detrimental to the health of the vine. So the Father cuts these lifeless, dry, withered branches off and are thrown away into the fire. These false branches represent superficial, false, religious believers who profess and are engaged even in Christian circles but produce no true fruit. They were never abiding in Christ in the first place. They've never truly, truly repented and been born again. Tonight I wonder, have you truly repented? Do you know you're in the vine? Are you one of the branches? God knows the true branches from the false, the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, the good fish and the bad fish. Even amongst the disciples there was a false branch, Judas Iscariot. The disciples didn't even realize up to this point until the very end. All the whole time he was amongst them, they thought he was part of them. But the Lord knew. He knew there was a devil amongst them. He was a false disciple. He was a false branch. He wasn't a true branch. And this is why, folks, this Bible, this word, many passages, James gives us 12 tests. John, of course, John gives us 12 tests. Paul spoke at the very end of the second letter of the Corinthians, and I believe there was a mixed bag there. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. What a tragedy! What is going to happen in the day of reckoning? Religious people, the Lord says, they were doing this for the Lord, they were even doing miracles, and the Lord says, Depart from me, and never knew you. They were never in. Peter says, examine yourselves, or Paul examine, make your calling and election sure. On different occasions, the scriptures remind us, be not deceived. And I dare say, I don't know every congregation, of course I don't, but God does. Practically every congregation is waiting for 
Lawson, who is a very, very far able preacher, and I have ever been gifted preacher, incredible teacher of God's word, by God's grace, of course, he believes the majority of the churches, and he was a pastor for many different years in different churches, he believes the majority of them that he taught were not even saved in the churches. Be not deceived, folks. This is critical. This is eternity we're dealing with here. The ultimate destiny that awaits these outward superficial false professing believers is eternal hell, the lake of fire. Verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and as withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Our land has full of professions and names thrown some in the old night and the prayer meeting the homeless. We're out of home. They're not abiding in Christ, so God says they're going to burn. Jesus warned about this in Matthew 7. So shall be the end of the war, the angels shall come forth and sacrifice the wicked from the just. There's going to be a great separation. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be willing and gnashing of teeth. Tonight, folks, as a close, I trust we are abiding in Christ. I trust God's ways are the light in our hearts. I trust we're the light in His commandments, as Jesus promised there. We will work for it. I know there's love and joy and pure fear. Possibly verse 5 he says, He that abideth in me and I am in the same bringeth forth much fruit. Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that you your joy might be full. God wants his people, folks, to be a joyful people. He wants his people to be a strong people in him. He wants his people to express God's love through them. How can we do that is by keeping God's commandments. We know we can't keep them perfectly, but a true believer will practice God's love, God's commandments consistently. God is the one who controls the thermostat. We mentioned that this morning. On the clock. He is the one who will prune his people. So we bear more fruit as we're being changed from glory to glory. He is the one who continues to refine us. Because, dear friends, the best advertisement for Christianity is Christ's likeness. It's not a church building. It's not a preacher. It's Christ's likeness. As McShane says, it's not great talents, God blesses, but Christ's likeness. I trust tonight we're in submission. We love his commandments. His commandments are not grievous. As the Lord continues to prune, shape, mold, build us up to be conformed to the image of his dear son. As the fruit of the Spirit should be evident to at least some degree in his people's lives. The Lord bless his will to us this evening. Thank you so much for the patience. Our time is gone for not even saying we'll just pray. Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for the seriousness of this passage. Yeah. Thank you, God. You're a God of illumination. You don't leave us in dark to speculate. And Father, I pray for every single person in this gathering that we will know. We know that assurance that our sins are gone. Yeah. We know that assurance we're children of God. We know that assurance Christ is our true vine and we are connected. We are the true branches of Him. I pray, Lord God, in these days, help us to submit, help us to love your word. 
We will continue to pray to sanctify us to make us more Christ-like. Father, we pray in these days that help us to bear more fruit for your glory. Inspire us, Lord God, in the pathway of holiness, that Christ, O God, will shine through us in these days. We pray, Lord God, thank you for every person who has gathered. Father, help us, Lord God, as the hymn writer says, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. O God, you don't leave us in the darkness back to you. John tells us, and you know you have eternal life. Father, I thank you and we praise thee that the Spirit witnesses with our Spirit that we're sealed until the day of redemption. We thank you for our position in Christ. We thank you for our security in Christ. We thank you, O God, that the old things have passed away and all things have become new. We thank you for the new nature in Jesus Christ. I pray you bless us, Lord God. Bless us in the youngest of us. Bless our fellowship. One with another night, and Lord God, as we depart a little bit later on. I pray you watch over us, help us to have a good week, Lord God, of your spur and heart, and we bring glory to thy name, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.